Good afternoon, it's Joyful Hermit. I'm going to talk about temporal, I'm spiritualizing the temporal world, spiritualizing our lives, meaning the Spirit of God, um, Holy Spirit, or as it's in Old Testament and New Testament, often the Spirit of God. So I'm not talking New Age type things. I'm talking about my great love of Christ and how I try to exude Christ, live Christ, put on Christ, surround myself with Christ and Christianity so that I am a witness in my everyday life. And I just started jotting down. I thought, well, there are not that many. And then <laughs> I jotted down all these ways. And I'm always thinking of more things. Well, it's not me the Holy Spirit brings to mind. So to spiritualize our lives, our temporal world, ask God to help. Ask, ask the Holy Spirit's great friend. Um, I love, in fact, sometimes I don't say the Holy, I just say Holy Spirit, you know. I'm on first name basis with Holy Spirit and Jesus and God the Father. But I, I, Ask and ye shall receive. You'll start getting ideas. Nudges. That's another thing. We have to get used to nudges of the Holy Spirit. And here's an example of how when I was out this morning, I had to get nerve testing. Owie, owie. They do these jabs and then do jolts of electrical current in you and stuff, testing my nerves. But um, on my way out, I saw an older woman. She was older than me, not by much probably, but she seemed maybe 80, but um, matronly, you know, how an older person should be um, as far as how we're used to, I'm used to older people, dressing a certain way. And she just looked like a lovely older woman, lovely. But as she passed me, I was waiting in line to get a blood test. And she passed me, and I had this nudge, but I didn't act on it right away. But there was something in her face and in her stance and her slow walk that I could tell she was just down, it needed uplift. She was coming out from getting her blood drawn. And so I battled with myself a little bit of wanting to lift her up and just to say how lovely she looked because she did i i thought why don't i fix myself up a little better but of course i don't that's not my thing but um i might try try doing that just to per to present myself better to other people maybe i should you know try to use the lotions or, you know, get my face less wrinkled. And when I'm pale, put a little blush on so that I don't look so ill to people. And a negative view, because here I am with this crucifix on, you know. I'm, I'm Jesus' representative in the temporal world. And it's not often that I'm out and about, but when I am, I should live Christ for people and joy and uplift. So I followed after her calling, ma'am, ma'am, ma'am. <laughs> and I, um, I finally uh, had the nudge and, and got ca caught up with this older woman. And somebody else even called out to her on, on my behalf, you know, when I was saying ma'am, ma'am, because um, I wanted to tell her just how lovely she looked and how beautiful her countenance. And so I did catch up with her in this hospital waiting area. She was on her way out the door. and She was sort of startled that I stopped her. But I took her hand in mine and looked at her in her eyes and smiled. And I said, you look so lovely. You just look so lovely. And this woman's face just lift, lit up. It was amazing. And I nearly missed that opportunity. 
I nearly didn't notice the depth of her as she walked by me in that hospital area. And it took a bit for me to decide, yes, I was going to reach her and hold hold her hand. I didn't grab it, but hold her hand and tell her how lovely she looked. And as soon as I did that, got a hold of her, you know, followed after her and called out. Somebody else said, oh, stop, you know, pointed to me that I was trying to talk to her. She probably thought it was someone she knew. It wasn't, but she loved it. She was, God used me to lift her up, and I nearly missed the opportunity. And I, it was amazing, the transformation in this older woman. And she said to me then, too, as she, she was, we, I'd finished talking with her, and uh, but it, I, it was important to have that hand touch. I could tell that was important to her, that I held her hand, stood face to face, and I just told her how lovely she looked. It's all it took. And she, I thought she was going to cry, but she didn't, you know, but it touched her. And she told me, she said, you really, really have made my day. Now, some people, sometimes we say that. This lady really meant it. Thank, thank you, Holy Spirit, for nudging me this morning and having me notice this woman walk by me. Enough for me to stop and turn and battle with myself. I spent like a minute letting her get ahead of me, getting weight that I, I had to really go after her then and call out because I could tell Holy Spirit wanted me to touch, give that woman a touch of love. So that was one thing, and it, it was powerful for me the way she reacted and responded, this woman did. So then, I, this was just this morning, I see I had this other, as I was leaving then to go out to the parking lot, I smiled at some people. And of course they were coming in to get tests or maybe to visit someone sick or they were sick themselves. And I realized that I haven't been smiling enough at people and uh, getting their eye contact as we walk by someone and smile. And if you get a chance then, Say whatever the Holy Spirit gives you to say. Could be something very brief. A smile is all, or um, eye contact. And we are touching, touching other people with the Holy Spirit, with Jesus and with God the Father. We are touching souls in the temporal world. We are bringing the spiritual into other people, people we don't know. And you're not, you don't have to say anything, Jesus this or God bless you even. It's through visual, it's through a word, a, a touch, a, a, a going an extra effort of smiling or um, noticing something about a person, particularly noticing if they're down if they need a touch of love. So here's some other things that I do that temporalize my daily life. So I'm reminded of Jesus all the time. Um, my microwave, when I heat something, and you probably just think this is ridiculous, but when I heat something and it's just become habitual with me, I started doing this years ago. Well, when I became a hermit and um, but I, I use num holy numbers. There's, there's holy numbers. I'm not talking about numerology, new, not new age. I'm talking about the number three for the Trinity, um, 12 for the apostles, 
10 for the Ten Commandments, 7, which is a holy number all through Scripture. But like um, um, 7 times 70, we forgive. Different numbers out of Scripture I will use. And those become the length, the numbers that I use on my microwave. So it might be um, 30 seconds, 33. I love 30 for the, the year approximately that Jesus started his, his public ministry. And then 33 when he uh, was the age when he was crucified. 40. 40 days out in the desert, 44 from the Old Testament. So I use numbers in my cooking that way. If it's, uh, if it's supposed to be so many minutes you have it in there or cooking something, I'll have it work out, filling my gas tank. I know it, it, I have the gas end filling my tank. I don't have it end on a six, six, on the devil number. It's always a holy number that I end up with in my filling my gas tank. So I'm there standing, filling my tank, watching, and it will automatically might click off on a something with a six, and I bump it up a little bit. So I get to 70, or 70. 70 times 7 of forgiving. Then I think about someone I need to forgive. So I utilize Old Test um, scriptural numbers, um, but biblical and religious. So it's not, like I say, it's not numerology or anything like that. I just utilize numbers that have meaning, Christian meaning. That's what I do with them. If I have any opportunities um, of utilizing a number for something in cooking or um, spreading fertilizer or whatever it is I'm doing, I remind myself of ho holy, holy aspects or holy numbers that are in the scriptures. Then I start thinking about that scripture. So it, it's just like that. Or a book of the Bible, like Samuel is the ninth book. This sort of started way back when I had a, a, an unusual dream. And all, all I heard this voice within the dream, though, say, was the ninth book, and it was printed. I could see it in the dream, but it used Ro Old English print and then, then a, a Roman numeral for ninth the ninth book printed out and and I had a hard time figuring out what it was I asked the librarian at school I was teaching then um, if she knew of a book like that she even called the main library to have them look in their some big index book that the high school library didn't have of books in print no no but she then suggested well, she knew I was a very religious, spiritual person and um, didn't wear a crucifix then. But she uh, said, well, could it be the ninth book of the Bible? Sure enough, it was that I was to read First Samuel. It helped me understand a lot about the school principal. He was a Saul figure, and I was his David. He was after me. So I just had to be very careful and work around that situation that year. But, yeah, so um, I find significance from Scripture, especially, but from anything holy, um, holy colors, liturgical seasons, I'll go down more of these. Like my passwords in our on our accounts, our, our Internet, we have to have passwords for this and that. I always use a holy name. Um, Jesus, God. Um, oh my gosh, I didn't write this down. When I, I have some artificial parts in my body now. Uh, my pump is Jesus saves. 
my knee is God knows. Um, any my my spine implementation. I realized now just now I haven't named that. I'll, I'll and I usually don't necessarily think of the names myself. I ask Holy Spirit or my angel to give me a name and it'll pop into my head some name or or a number to use uh, like 144 that's from the Old Testament if I have to uh, heat something up that's going to take over a minute I'll make sure I land on some significant number from the Bible or <laughs> you know it's it's become second nature to me. And so God permeates my day. The scriptures do, or books that I've read, like Richard Roll now. Uh, he and I are, we, I think we, we're soul friends across the centuries. We're a lot alike in different ways. Um, as I water, what are my things? I, I stand a certain length of time and I'll, I'll say the Lord's Prayer, a Hail Mary, and the um, Glory Be to the Father. And if something's extra dry, I'll add on something. If I don't say the Lord's Prayer slowly enough or so that I remember what I prayed, you know, you know how we can, prayers that are so typical to us, we can say them and as if we don't even remember we've said them. We just go through the words, but our minds, especially my mind, because it's so used to now escaping pain, that it just goes out easily, it just goes out. And I don't know where I've been even with it. And, um, but I, I make sure if I say it too fast, I stand there and water that pot extra much and repeat the Lord's Prayer so that it has meaning to it. Um, and I do prayers like that for other things. If I'm standing waiting for something to heat, if I don't have something else to do in the kitchen with the microwave heating, or if I'm cooking something or waiting for it to boil, then I'll say some prayers. Some, you know, the Lord's Prayer I like. It's the prayer Jesus taught us. But um, that will become sort of a, a something to do if I have a minute or two even. Um, or I'll, I'll say praises to God, uh, different praises, um, rather than just letting my wine, mind go off on some worry or, oh, don't forget to do this or that. I feel, I feel that space of waiting with a prayer of some sort, usually one that, that is I know well, and <clears throat> one that will honor God. Uh, names. I like holy names. I named my children with holy meanings. I, I don't name unless it has a holy meaning. Uh, my dogs, love and mercy. Um, other dogs I've had or other pets have had names with significance to someone who is like uh, G.K. Chesterton. One dog I named after him, so he was Gilbert, um, a great a great Catholic convert and writer from England. Um, my first dog I ever got when I was a child. I named him Mel. Out, I got him at Christmas, and I, I was 10 years old, so this goes way back, um, because I want things to be blessed and holy and to remind me also. So Melchior, Melchior was one of the wise men. So his name was Melchior Lancelot, then my last name. And, and so... Lancelot, because uh, beagles are Old English, they came from England. So Lancelot is an English knight name. So it was Melchior Lancelot, and his nickname was Mel then. 
this little beagle. <laughs> I don't know how many males there were named dogs named that. It also it you know people were oh my you know boy that's different. What does that mean? I like it when someone asks what something means. Then I can explain, and I get myself even in trouble. So I bring the spiritual into the doctor's office. Like when I explained to that doctor, the oncologist, why I wasn't all excited that I was going to live. It gave me opportunity to give my death experience witness to him. I never know that doctor could have gone out and been hit and killed. And he might have been worrying before he died. But I had already told him the death experience and how wonderful and easy it is not to be afraid. And why I was, why I was disappointed because I'd been looking forward to be, being with Jesus. So I, I use opportunities like that even though it kicks me. This is like the third or fourth time that, that then he had me talk to a social worker because he couldn't understand even though I gave my witness of my death experience and how good in it that was why. I was disappointed that, that it wasn't turning out that I only had a few months to live. So um, anyway, I, I named different things in the house. Every room is named for something religious or holy, like this room is the resurrection room. I have uh, my... Um, Our Lady of Solitude Chapel upstairs. Um, I have the angel's room, the priest's room, the uh, body of Christ room, meaning all of us. Um, I have um, Virgin Mary room. Um, John the Baptist bathroom. The Pool of Siloam bathroom is down here. Um... I haven't done the guest bath yet. Um, The entry is the body of Christ um, because that's where everybody enters in. Um, Kitchen is Martha, St. Martha and Mary. I include her because she did go to help her sister Martha. A dining room is bread of life. So, yes, I and then let's see, artwork. Well, the only artwork I have is religious art. And I would justify having beauty artwork of nature and things like that, trees and scenes, and even of of people, especially if they are. I have ancestor photographs. I have photographs of people, but um, those remind me to pray for them. Just like if I I have statues, they remind me of that person or of God or Jesus or Mary. Um, So um, any kind of reminders like that that help remind to pray, but also remind me of God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit. And I have a friend, this, this one friend, her husband's an artist, and he does religious art and he... He will do a, a, a scene from some scripture. So I have, I'm, I'm a collector of his. I haven't bought any for a couple of years, but um, because of my my funds. But if I do have a a month that it's, I'm, I'm want to get another. Um, and he does series of things, too. Series from scriptures. Um, he did the Song of Songs. So I have one of those images. That I, that's what I have across from my bed where I can look at Jesus or God gazing at his beloved. And of course, I put myself in there. You know, It's Jesus looking at me, waiting for me. Um, so my plants and trees that I get, I don't know if you're familiar with Mary Gardens. You can look online. You can get a list in the Middle Ages the plants were named for holy, like snapdragon. They're the infant's shoes. Every flower, every tree in medieval times was had another name to it. 
and they were given religious names. Aspects of Jesus, aspects of God, of Mary. Um, I think it's geraniums are called Mary, were called Mary's praises. At one time I had most of them memorized. And the, the flowers that I would buy, the perennials and things, and the herbs, all had to be, and, and any trees or, or shrubs too, all had to have relig Mary Garden names. And I'd memorize, and then I could tell people. I didn't have many people come to my hermitage, but when I would, and if they would want a tour, I would give the middle age name, which had to do with something religious, and then explain like, well, Mary Gold, that's easy. Mary's Gold. Um, anyway, there's, see the list. And so my, my whole yard is based on the, the Mary Garden names of things. So I like, I like doing that. Um, prayer items. I have, I have prayer items. That means, you know, like if I'm praying for someone, I like to have something of significance of that person if possible. So like praying for my parents or ancestors on the other side. I have items from my dad and mother. This was a ring of my dad's and this was a ring of my mother's. And so there, my spiritual dog wed me to the cross and blessed their rings when I put them on here. Um, I have, e I have my, each of my children when they were in college would gave me a something to wear. Well, my uh, one daughter who was in the army gave me an army t-shirt and the other, the son gave me a t-shirt from his high school and also from, um, it's a Catholic high school, also from his, uh, Catholic university. And my eldest daughter gave me a t-shirt from her university. And I wear them on days that I am particularly praying for them. I wear those because they're prayer items that, that represent them and came from them. And um, I remember one time a, a woman, she had gotten married to someone, um, and it was her second marriage, his first. But he, unfortunately, he had an affair with an off, a woman in his office. He had a dealership or something, and it was just a secretary who worked there. And it crushed her. It was fairly fresh into the marriage, even. I think they just had a first baby or something. And um, she found out, but, and, they, and it, they, kept, they stayed together all these years and everything. But it was horrible for her, and she came to me and told me and was horribly upset, of course. And I was determined to pray and I wanted something. Well, she brought me a couple of pieces of his hair and I used those as my prayer tangible. And I would hold those hairs in my hand and at night I put them under my pillow because I prayed intently for her for that marriage. And and uh, many people, and her mother was, most people didn't know that it was, in fact, I think just her parents and myself, probably a good girlfriend of hers or two knew. But um, I, I, want, I told her, I said, I want something of, that will, something of him. And um, tangible that I would viscerally feel and pray over for that for him to repent, which he did, and ask forgiveness and have a conversion of life. So things like that, um, just anything that, that has connection with a person, I, I will utilize any kind of even reminder, if it isn't even theirs, but if it reminds me of the person, then I will, that, that's what I use as prayer items. I, I light candles for different purposes. Lighting a candle is, for me, inviting the light of Christ. 
and the fire of the Holy Spirit. So I, um, or the burning bush of God, you know. So I utilize candles a lot. And on certain days, or if someone is having something that I know they need extra prayer, I'll, I have a dresser over there, it's sort of my altar, right across from me. It's one, uh, one of my ancestors built it in about in the mid to probably 1850, 1860. And so that has significance for me too. And that's where I put the candle. And um, if I have flowers, I put that there. And then I have the, the image from the Song of Songs behind it. So um, food and recipes. When we had the, the soup kitchen, or when I was still involved in that, I did a cookbook. But even before anybody else started helping me, from the very get-go, every soup that I made and, and anything else, muffin or whatever, I named them for the names of saints or religious days, like Trinity Sunday or um, Holy Family, Feast of the Holy Family. So... And then I did little write-ups, a little brief write-up of the saint or of the religious significance of the day. <clears throat> and then would name, depending on the day that I was cook, that I made the soup for, which, for the deliveries, um, what saints were in that area or what religious significant day. Epiphany. Um, we had, an, I think there were some epiphany muffins or something. Um, so recipes, and the other night I made Padre Pio spaghetti sauce. I just made it up, but it had a lot of Italian things in it. And, and when I was thinking, oh, I'd like to name this spaghetti sauce, when I was make, in the process of making it, and, you know, what, what would be a good name? Well, in Pops Padre Pio, because I noticed probably subconsciously that everything I was putting in it was extra Italian type of food. Garbanzo beans and zucchini, um, lots of onion and garlic and tomatoes and um, the herbs I used that I grow fresh, um, they were in it. So Padre Pio came to mind. And uh, I'm so grateful to Padre Pio and I'm very apologetic to him still. It's been years been years, nearly 30 years, but I, I, he warned me of tricks of the devil coming in a dream, and I <clears throat> fell to a horrible trick of the devil, and I felt that I lost the privilege of Padre Pio coming to me through that. I haven't had him come to me with in a dream or a vision or with locutions or things. So I wanted to honor him and thank him anyway um, with his spaghetti sauce. So let's do that. Colors that I use in my house, exterior and interior, they have to have significance and have to be a color and, and often a name. If a name stands out to me, um, at, at, there, there can be holy names in paint colors. Um, that's the one I'll use. <laughs> and I'll develop a theme of colors, of Eucharistic colors, for example. I did that in one house. That was my first anchorage. I called it the anchorage. It was an anchor hold. Um, and it was an old house. And I had um, blood red and golds and in wallpaper and um, <clears throat> the living room and dining room were painted sort of the color of a, of a consecrated host. Um, so I, I kept with that. Um, I had wallpaper that had butterflies. Butterflies are representative of angels and um, on, on that line I do that. Um, <clears throat> oh yes, because here I, I'm using um, dove white quite a bit. There's dove wing in one of uh, in the upstairs bedrooms, 
including the angel's room, is painted dove wing color that was called dove wing. Um, and then, what else do I have going on? Once pale oak. And some, um, I've read that some have thought that that the, uh, the cross may have been oak, but I don't think so. I don't think they had oak then over there. But um, it, it gave me the sense of tremendous strength, of, of Jesus's tremendous strength. And oaks grow to be very large and very strong and enduring. They're very enduring wood. Um, oh, outside, my paint color for the exterior is anonymous, plus um, dove white and pale oak. But the anonymous is the main color, and it's a darkish color. But the name anonymous, because I try to remain anonymous as a hermit. And then I name the house, too, like this is Solus Deus. Um, one house was Agnes Day, the island house was Dove House for the Holy Spirit. Um, books, well, really the only books I own are religious books or biographies of saints or Bibles or um, that's it. Now, obviously, when I had children in the home, you know, we had other books. I had other books for them that they needed for the world. And when I was in the world, I had my books on my degrees, the psychology, my DSM, I think it was 4R at the time, uh, the diagnostic book for, for clinical psychologists when I was working on that PhD. So, um, you know, I, I we have to be reasonable. This is... This is these are the lists that someone who is a religious solitary does, who's who's joyful hermit. But anyone who is, you know, your family's grown and you don't need to have the children's books and that to properly socialize and and not warp them um, with overkill of be of religion when they're young and they may not be called to a religious life. I always had religious books around for my children also, but a variety. Um, and they all were called to the world, to the temp active life. So they needed to have that balance. I don't have to have balance. Um, I am balanced within God. Uh, this very first priest who really took a disliking to me, um, he resented very much, and one time admitted, said, why do you have these things and I don't? I ought to be having messages, not you. I'm a priest, you know. Yes, he was. And I said, I don't know why you don't. He asked me, why don't I? I said, I don't know. Ask God, you know. Um, maybe he wouldn't have been able to take all the humiliation and the persecution that someone like me has gotten. So I don't know. Uh, or I'm so weak that God knew I needed his extra help. But um, he, he, he accused me of being imbalanced. And I said, I am balanced within the segment of of Christianity. I'm right in the middle. <laughs> I'm in the center of God, in the center with God. And that's where I was when I had my death experience. We were in the very center of a huge sphere. And it was very dark, but there was light all around the peripheral. We were right in the very center of this sphere. And that's how I keep myself. I am not rigid with religion I'm not I'm I'm respectful of other people's beliefs and re religious beliefs um, I interact normally with people P 
people today wouldn't know that I'm a hermit at all. They, If they notice the crucifix, they would notice that I'm Christian and likely that I'm Catholic because of the corpus on the crucifix, but on the cross. But um, this is... Um, Balance is important, but if you are in a religious vocation, your balance shifts to being balanced within the context of being a hermit, for example. And you need to be in the middle. You don't want to be on the fringe because then you start losing your vocational focus and you start going off course as far as what you discuss and what you share and what you think about. You, you get drawn back into the world that way. Uh, movies and programs. If I watch something, like I've mentioned, these British detective or police shows, usually detective or mystery, um, it's always with the intention of keeping in touch with what's going on out in the world. And in these characters, even the characters used, have their problems that everyday people have. But as a hermit, I can easily come out of touch with that, unaware of what other people are going through who are out in the temporal world, through no fault of their own. God just called them to the temporal life. So they're working in this or that vocation or a career. And it doesn't mean that they're any less special and holy than anyone else. But that was their calling. So that programs remind me. Within one hour of watching a program and dozing off and on through it, which is another reason why I watch, because it helps me fall asleep. Their British accents do. But I get a full reminder of a multitudinous spectrum of problems that people have and live with, including crimes committed, including what people like police go through or their families go through or the victims go through or the perpetrators go through. All of their issues, their troubles, their trials in life. And then I am reminded of so many things to pray about for people out in the world without having to have any specific person that I know who ha happens to have those issues. So it, it's an excellent um, stabilizer for me as far as uh, being stable in my prayer life of a broad base of social, personal, social, uh, racial, um, religious, political issues, prayer, prayer topics. Um, I also utilize silence. I, I spiritualize the temporal through silence of trying to observe when I'm out among people or observe if I'm in my yard or in the neighborhood watching, seeing, um, and then being quiet so that I can hear God, hear if he speaks, and also be aware of nudges, like this morning's nudge, to go after that woman, when I would have done it immediately. But I was battling with myself. Is it going to startle her? Is it going to seem really stupid to her? But just her, I just read it, read her essence, that she was downcast and burdened by aloneness and not well, being elderly and not well. And um, even though she was so fixed up and beautiful, she was, and I told her, I said, you know, I admire, I said, I come like this. And I said, you just look lovely and you lift up all around you. I said, I noticed you immediately as a beautiful person. So um, I wouldn't have had I been noisy within or even verbally, but I was just standing there and observed and 
It was like the Holy Spirit tapped me on the shoulder and said, this woman is lovely, but she doesn't feel she's lovely. Uh, tell her, you know. So take the nudges. Pay attention to your nudges from Holy Spirit. And Jesus will give nudges and God the Father. But the Holy Spirit is more the enactor of the love between the Father and the Son. The Holy Spirit delivers the messages to us, brings the love to us, um, and reminds us in, is part of the Trinity. But the Holy Spirit is more the enacting part of the Trinity, the interactive part. Um, when out, smile, use kindness, encourage others. Sometimes it's, it's just sort of like a fun enterprise to um, engage. Like in, I engaged the, the neurologist who was putting these needles in and things and found out about his family dogs and um, why he had the one kind and you know just different things like that where he got his training and try to develop a rapport because when we're out with people um, that's our opportunity for a soul to meet another soul to have a bond with soul to soul with someone and to make a connection brief as it might be even paying our bill if we or if we're at shopping i try to engage and to say something positive and something uplifting um the other day i was observing which which register worker was the quickest <laughs> because there were huge lines and standing is agony for me in one place on concrete floor and so i got in the line with this young woman and she was the fastest, I noticed. And I told her that. I said, you've been deemed the fastest. I said, we're all here because, you know, we noticed that you, you're very skilled and adept and, and work diligently and quickly. And with that, she, you can sense this uplift in people. It has to be a genuine compliment. You don't want to just be like Eddie Haskell, for those of you who know the Leave it to Beaver show that was in the 50s and 60s. Um, Eddie Haskell was this kid that was so hypocritical and brown-nosed the parents and was basically otherwise a jerk, <laughs> known as very narcissistic, but a scrawny, Weasley kind of kid. And um, all this, you know, exaggerated type of personality for the show, for the program, for humor, but um, he was always falsely brown-nosing, um, complimenting Beaver and, and Tony's, not with Tony, was Wally, the, the Beaver and Wally's parents, you know, um, all these exaggerated, fawning compliments of, of the mother in particular, so. It needs to be genuine, and God will always show us the good in people. Once you start, you know, getting into spiritualizing the temporal, the, the Holy Spirit loves it and enjoys helping, helping with new ways to do it. Um, even with my dogs, I know, I've noticed, and I've been down on one of them. I don't want to say his name. He's just, he know he takes advantage. He knows I'm not well and weak, not strong, and, and my shoulder and all. And so he doesn't listen. He disobeys. And But at the dog park, he, he loves people so much, but he's become obnoxious. How many people want a dog climbing up on them or trying to sit on their laps and to hug them with his arms around, you know, reaching for them? And, he has extra salivary glands. He, he's the most slobbery dog ever. And he loves kissing. And these people don't want this wet, dripping tongue, just bathing them and all. But he, he's getting rejected because he just, he loves and loves. He's like addicted to loving people. And he's needy for attention, even though he gets loads here. So, um... You know, just a different personality, but I've been, you know, praying to 
not be frustrated with them here and to um, not re not have him feel rejected. So, because he, he just, he's always moving and pacing and stands up on the door even though he never supposed to, he can't go out, always saying, giving him the command, the OFF command. And after about three or four firm ones, he'll get down, but he's, um, you know, trying to, trying to love him, yet continue on being consistent, but he's not easy. Um, but, but like with that, just not just with people, but I try to encourage my dogs to goodness, positive reinforcement as much as possible. Stamps. I use I buy enough Madonna stamps at Christmas to use them year round. It's a small little witness on an envelope, but and it used to be more. We don't send many things now, but I also like to send notes and cards to people, and I write out always a blessing of God or my prayer for you is this or that, and I make that a witness. And I did that before I had a vocation. And of course, 95 or 98% of anyone I would send a card to, they don't know my identity, my religious identity. They don't need to. Um, it's not anything that anyone out there needs to know. It's better if they know that they can trust us to pray for them. So I have people ask me to pray for them. Not because they know anything about me being a hermit. No, they don't. But they sense through how I spiritualize my temporal world. So even in texts that I send, um, emails, and written notes. And I have a, I like to always sign off, love in Christ's love, or I'll say love in his love. And I've noticed some of my, the people I've emailed to, they, they've adopted that also. So it spreads that. Um, refocusing at the end of a message of what our focus is and our purpose. It's to love in God's love. To love as God loves. To love as Christ's love. To love in Christ's love and through Christ's love. Um... I've already mentioned my account names that um, I try to use holy names for my accounts. Um, I wear the crucifix. That's a, that's my sign of what I am, of who who I live for. But I don't bring it up or mention it, um, and unless some if somebody asks or says, "Oh, that's beautiful," and if they have time. I'll tell them the miraculous story of how this was given to me in most unusual, strange circumstance. Um, back in 2003 it was. June of 2000, no, maybe May. May or June of 2003. I think it was June. Um, colors. Okay, when I started wearing uh, I got rid of all my clothes at one point, and then I wore this gray uh, gray jumper, and then that, of course, I stood out. Who wears the same thing, a gray jumper, gray t-shirt, gray socks, all the time? Well, it's I stood out. I realized, oh, this isn't going to work any more than the habit worked that I wore for four months when I was in a community and we were supposed to do that. Then I got out of it. it I wasn't going to... That goes against the hermit life to wear something that is going to make you obvious and stand out, stick out, um, draw attention to ourselves. No, we're not to do that. So I developed a scripture. I mean, I, I, absor I, I took on a scripture, and it is these, um, um, the scripture of the... Um, the seed that dry, dry, 
um, draw, drops to the ground and um, grows then into something beautiful. It's that scripture. I'll have to find it. Um, but like the seed that falls to the ground, it um, dies and then has rebirth, regrowth. It's that scripture that I use. So I have clothing. I bought clothing. It's been, would have been 2004, I think, or 2005 when I stopped the gray jumper and I bought clothing that would blend in with the cathedral group, how they dressed. Nicely dressed, but nothing, anything too fancy. And I went to TJ Maxx and would get whatever they had on sale. But I used that scripture of the grain that fell to the ground, was crushed, died, and reborn. And then I used, so I used colors, holy colors, whole, the earth, brown for the earth, um, reds for blood, the blood of Christ, off-white for the host, for the Eucharist. Um, I had uh, just little bits of gold or touch of yellow for Christ, for, the, for the Son of God and for um, holiness. And then um, purple for Advent and Lent. Um, bits of white and black um, for angels and for death, you know, for that, but not much. But uh, I, I followed pretty much with the colors that went along with that scripture and with the liturgical season. Green, purple, red, white. White for the Holy Spirit, the Trinity and Holy Spirit. Um, and then, oh, I had touches of blue, like a blue sweater. I still, I have those for years, see? You don't wear things out um, when you use utilize them like that. So the blue was for, like, for uh, First Saturdays, the Virgin Mary and any Marian celebration day. And red and and white and black and things for Christ, for the crucifixion. So, Epiphany. And then I would wear those colors on those days. Different feast days and different commemorative days in the life of Christ. And for the Virgin Mary, for God and for the Holy Spirit. And it's very simple very simple wardrobe, but all with that spiritual. So when I get dressed, if I don't go someplace or if I do, I myself am reminded of what my very clothing and color of the clothing reminds me of relative to God and to the spiritual life. Um... And it wasn't anything I did all of a sudden. Although, since I was just down to only wearing a gray jumper, I had two two for summer and spring, and two were corduroy to get me through the winter, warmer clothing. But um, I didn't have much that I had to accumulate, and there was not much that I needed to get rid of either when I went into the clothing to be a witness, the colors and all, and simple style. Um, my sharing, like in these videos, and my writing of my blog when I wrote my blog. Um, that all was all focused, was supposed to be focused on um, spiritualizing the temporal, sharing about my temporal life that could be pretty icky when the devil would get involved in trying to tear me down or or I would slip and fall back and lose my own footing with God. And then I would write, or I'm trying to share about 
give example of how you climb out of the cistern and you move forward in the glory of God then. Keep moving when you've been down. Get back up. Um, I have a motto. And I, in fact, I have more than one. Um, but it's good to develop a motto. And uh, one of my mottos is just adore him. That came to me in the sanctuary um, during a, I think it was a some kind of a retreat weekend way back. It was before I was in my, my vocation, my, my religious solitary, my hermit vocation. But um, that motto came to me, just adore him. It's a message from the Virgin Mary telling me to adore her son. And that was my motto and still is. So I utilize that. Um, understand that we have a heavenly name. That God will give us a name for heaven. Already has one picked out for us. So I have that heavenly name in my heart. And I think about it. And I um, try to live, live that name. Prepare myself to be that name in heaven. Um, oh, any tasks that we do, whether it be doing laundry, make a bed, um, take the dogs out for a walk or to the dog park or work on the house, an overall task of like trying to renovate a house, also down to the little tiniest of tasks taking the trash out. Set the purpose. Set a religious and holy goal for that, for that activity, for that action. Set, set a standard for it, of, of what, it, what it's dedicated to. Um, what aspect of God is... Um, cleaning something, cleaning the toilet even, or dedicate everything as a prayer intention even. Like I'm going to do this activity or this effort as a prayer for so-and-so. That's how you can temporalize, spiritualize your verbal prayer or spiritualize your intention for um, shoveling a walk of snow or um, brushing your dog's fur or cleaning the refrigerator or going to the grocery. Set prayer intentions through, through act, active things that we do. Um, signs. Um, have um, different signs of God that were given. Um, dedicate those for something. Um, when we're in stores, as I mentioned, develop relationships, mention the liturgical colors, uh, encounters with others, our prayer life. Um, be creative with the prayer life. I think I've mentioned in one of the videos how I had this big, beautiful Chinese, it was a bowl from mainland China, and I put plain white squares of paper in a pile. They were loose, though, but they were stacked up. I just cut them and put them on a table beside that big bowl from China. And it was at my entryway, and I had a pen there without ink. I took the ink out of the pen, the ink stick out. And I would invite people, and I put in a couple or three myself of these notes that were invisible. I would write with no ink coming out of the pen, but I would write, even though I couldn't see the words and no one else could, my prayer intention. And I would fold the piece of paper and drop it down in the prayer in the hope bowl. I called it the hope bowl for hope. Because hope that is seen is no hope at all. And we were writing our hopeful prayers 
with inkless pen so no one could see. Even though they were folded or put in blank, put in flat, most people would fold them. There was nothing written that you could see. But they had written it with an inkless pen. Their heart was written. Their heartfelt prayer was on that paper, invisible. And it was in that hope bowl. I invited anyone who came or went to feel free to leave a prayer intention. Then I would go to that bowl and stand there and pray by myself silently or sometimes aloud when the house was empty for all the unseen prayers in that hope bowl. I only had one person, uh, um, somebody, I think they were, uh, yeah, they were from this uh, church connected with the college. It was a brethren, I think. And this couple um, who were very anti-Catholic and I had converted to Catholicism. But this is something I would have done Catholic or not. Just happened to come to me. The Holy Spirit had it come to mind when I was Catholic, maybe a couple of months into being Catholic or maybe longer, maybe five months in, this idea came. Use that big, beautiful bowl that was in the entry hall as an interest piece, as an antique piece from another country, another culture, as my hope bowl. So, But they were very bothered by it. They thought it was some freaky, weird, cultish, Catholic, strange thing to do. <laughs> and I explained, no, it wasn't. But in fact, the man got upset. He just sort of stormed out and had a horrible look on his face. The wife hesitated, was thinking about doing a inkless message, prayer written out. But um, I did I never push things like that because it can be very hard for people to understand. Not everyone is um, having fun with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I have fun with the Holy Spirit. You can too. Many of you do. But um, So that was the hope bowl. And there's other ways that I would pray. I'd have a list of people to pray for in... Um, one of my houses had an entry that sort of was in the shape of a T, and you'd go walk from the family room across the hall into the bedroom wing. And at the end of, in between those rooms was a hallway, and I had a, a dresser there, sort of a low, low dresser of some sort, and no back to it. And that's where I would keep my list of prayer needs for people. And I would stick it underneath something so other people wouldn't see what people wanted me to pray for. These were things they'd told me, and I would write down a name, just a first name or initials, and then a dash and what they needed prayer for, just briefly. Just something that would trigger me to know, to remember what they wanted. The Hope Bowl was all very private. They didn't say what their prayer needs were. They just wrote on these papers with an inkless pen. So it was an invisible. But but it was on there. Those were on those papers from their heart through the action. This is all part of the kinesthetic tactile praying that I, I sort of coined that word for this of um, in smaller ways of spiritualizing the temporal. That spiritualizing um, temporal objects to use in prayer process. That's what I do with plants and trees and flowers. Of having a prayer plant or a tree, a prayer tree for someone. The lady who um, is bothered by me and my hermit life. She, I pray. Those, those white petunias out there in the front are her prayer plant. And I'll probably at some point, when those die to the fall and winter, I'll get something in the winter landscape to pray for. That every time I see it, or even think about it in my mind, that's a prayer, and I'll say a prayer for this woman. So, 
That's, and I have those for people living and dead. Um, Father Vincent has a prayer tree here. My kids, my eldest daughter, she, she loved this one bush when she was here last year with my knee replacement surgery. Um, I was so pleased that she readily said, oh, I love this one. Whereas when they were younger, you know, and they're, oh, mom, you know, what's this, you know, and wouldn't or were bothered by my gardening, excessive gardening, I must say. My one place, it was in excess, but it was, I had the time of my life. And as as my spiritual daughter says, you're glorifying God. You're glorifying God. They were spectacular gardens. And I'm glad I did it. Never would I have had another chance to have such beautiful gardens. Even though they didn't last long, I had to dig everything up because of the neighbor lady and having to move away for my uh, safety and the safety of anyone who visited me because of the threats of the neighbor lady. But um, a place you couldn't really do a whole lot. Um, payments. When I hire kids or adults and pay, um, I'll set the hourly rate rate at something that has holy significance. Years ago, it was tw that was a lot of money then for a kid to get $12 an hour. But I told these brothers and a sister who had helped me move one summer several times. They had to uh, help me. Um, uh, well, they wanted to. They agreed to. But I always felt like, you know, I was, they knew I needed the help. So it wasn't like it was just, oh, we're thrilled to help you, you know. Um, I, I had to ask them, you know, I had to press upon them. And it was three times because I, the devil was on me that summer. I haven't talked about that. Another way the devil was after me, not liking what I was doing, and so I had to move three different times within about three or four weeks. So these dear kids were, they'd come and in the evenings or weekend and load up my rental truck and get it to a storage or get it to the next place and then come move all that. And I did a lot of packing and unpacking and packing again uh, that summer. But... Um, I said $12 an hour, which was a lot then. Most people got like seven. Most kids got seven an hour then. But they were doing heavy lifting for me. And they were, they're were good, holy kids too. Their mother's a very wonderful mother. And and uh, I said for the 12 apostles. You know, they said, oh no, 11. I said, no, it can't be 11. It has to be 12 because I said, unless you want 10 for the 10 commandments, you know. <laughs> so... No, 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 they were happy with the 12 then. but And I said, you're like the 12 apostles. They had a, came from a family of eight kids. and said, Get, you were working up to that, to 12. But um, fun times. So, and, and if I make donations or now gifts, like if, if 30 or $33, instead of $25, most people get $25. I'll make it 30 or 33 um, I will use 24 and think of double the apostle, double the disciples, but um, that's for microwave only if I, you know. But I'll, I'll also um, add birthday, dates of birthdays, eternal birthdays and, and earthly birthdays. And my mother and dad, I'll add their birth dates together. And have that be a microwave number. And as I'm standing there, I'm saying a prayer of gratitude for my mother and father. And ask them to pray for me or to pray for my family, things like that. So that's spiritualizing the temporal also. With, with what we pay, gratuities, I will make it um, the amount. Some 77, I like that one. Um a donation of $77, write that on the check. And one time one person did ask me, you know, and, you know, well, what was this What was this amount for? You know, because it seemed different. I think it, I did a, did a little birthday gift of 33 And um, 
And I wrote, I said, well, that's the year they think Christ. Died. She says, well, I knew it would have some significance. That's why I asked. So my best best friends know. Um, Mention the hope. Oh, I used to bake sugar cookies. And I had holy cookie cutters. I had a church. I had a cross. I had an angel, a star, a bell. Um, seems like I had some others that were. Oh, I had a Virgin Mary one. Um, still have them, but it's a stand and bake like that. I don't. And, um, people now don't tend to want cookies. They're very health conscious, the people I know anyway. But if anyone would come, then I would have these holy cookies to serve. Um, and when I had my, my joyful hermit, hermit um, little business, I had fortitude fudge. I had hermit hermit cookies. There's a cookie called hermit, and I'd make hermit hermit cookies. Um, I had joyful hermit's mystical mist. I made it was a delicious liqueur, a whiskey based liqueur, with seven mysterious blends or hues from um, flavors from I can't tell you what they are because it's secret mystical recipe uh, maybe sometime I will but so I had that to serve if people came I still have one bottle left of of joyful hermits mystical mist and um though you know just everything you know I just <laughs> the sky's the limit oh also I would script and depending on the house but I scripted in the first the anchorage because it it just lent itself above the, on the woodwork, above uh, the door to the next room, you know, where you're entering. In Old English script, I painted Bread of Life. And um, I had the Jesus prayer just at the base of the stairs. You came down to a landing and then turned. And there's a space on the wall above. And I scripted in lavender to purplish blue watercolor um the jesus prayer lord jesus christ have mercy upon me a sinner because my son and i we would he would rush down the stairs because he was a teen at the time and or well he's getting out of high school that's when i became a hermit but he would uh you'd have to sort of stop to turn at the landing to go down that last three stairs and you you know to see You'd see that there, and I wanted it as a reminder to us. And when I would come down, I would see that any time um, before I went out into the world. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. Then at the top of the stairs, and I had butterfly. It was the stairway to heaven, stair step, stairwell. I have a stairway to heaven one here, too. And at the top, I had this a picture of Jesus' head, and I had printed out and put in with the frame in the when I framed it. I put it underneath the the, the head of Christ, um, the uh, scripture from the last verse of of John one, John one thirty one, that um, you know the uh, when the clouds parted and and um, Jesus mentions the stairway to heaven. So I forget exactly what that one, what that scripture is. But so I did that at the top of the stairs when we were rising up. And then I had the sinner, the reminder that we are sinners be, and to be blessed and help us, Lord Jesus, as we go out into the world. And on the front door, as we went out, it, was, it had a big glass old antique front door. And I scripted on that Omnia Pro Deo. All for God. As you leave that house, we would be reminded. We're going out to live all for God. So uh, that was just reminders. Oh, I used to make, when I wrote more letters and mailed them, did uh, handwritten and typed out correspondence to people. I made my own, um, I would take the uh, church calendar from the year before that had uh, pictures 
uh, it's all print of paintings and things of Christ or Mary or different, the Holy Spirit or angels. And and if anyone get, would give me a calendar, it would be a religious calendar, they would know what I would like. And then I would make envelopes out of that and put white labels on the envelope so that all the mailmen who would pass that envelope and stamp it, you know, run it through and deliver it, pick it up, and the mailman who would deliver it on the other end would see this reminder of a religious scene from Jesus' life. And they could easily see then the addressee and who it's from because I'd use white labels and then write their names on that and the addresses. But the whole envelope was a picture. Then I had my little Virgin Mary Madonna stamp on it. And so often... Uh, Madonna with child, it usually is. So, um, mention my closure. And then just talking with God. Get in the habit of talking with God wherever you are, within your house, without your house, um, driving. Um, I don't play them, but I have CD, religious CDs, music, religious music, um, operas, um, uh, the different masses, Bach's Mass in B minor and Mozart's Mass in C or C minor and on and on. You get all kinds of things. I, I really love Aaron Neville's voice and he has gospel songs that he sang. So I have a CD. My daughter informed me the other day that no one does CDs anymore. Didn't even stop to think of it, but I have my CD player, and and um, I guess I don't know what they use, Bluetooth, or I don't know what that is, but um, now you just have your iPhone and get iMusic or something or on your laptop and get whatever music you want, but I just have it be uh, religious music or even... Um, Music. I have I have a CD, but I've noticed it's online. Um, Hildegard de Bingen wrote music and sang. So "Feather on the Breath of God" was one of her songs, and she that's online. You can get that on YouTube. That music from the Middle Ages, music from the Middle Ages, from that people in the Middle Ages lived their lives like this, like they all their plants were had some significance connected with Jesus and Mary and disciples and things. So uh, like St. John's Wort, I just bought a couple of those for my Mary Gardens here. It's a, um, I think they call it Klamath weed in Washington State and Oregon and stuff, but, but the Middle Ages name that has stuck with it is St. John's Wort, named after St. John the Baptist. And there's a legend that goes with it. But that, that is going off onto all these other little things that I would love to tell you about. But look up the legend of St. John's Ward if you want. Otherwise, I'll talk about it another time. I did way back in an early video, but um, also. So that's my list. And there may be things I'm forgetting about that I, oh, even the tie to my, and John the Baptist bathroom in that house back there. I have a shower curtain that was plain, but a tie back that I scripted St. John the Baptist on it. And on that mirror, at the top of the mirror in that bathroom, I wrote, I scripted out in Latin what um, St. Jerome said, follow <laughs> naked the naked Christ. I think it's um, <laughs> nudus Christi nudum sequeri in Latin, something like that. Um, so then see, somebody would say, well, what is that on your bathroom mirror? What does that mean? Then I could tell them. So a lot of these things, if you have any visitors to your hermitage, or if you're not a hermit, it'll work even better. You'll become a living witness because people will be fascinated by this or that. Or if you're giving them a little tour of your house that you've just painted some rooms, explain the paint color and the significance and what that room is dedicated to. Or, or ask them if they're spending the night, well, do you want to be in, in the priest's room or the angel's room or the all saints room? So, sort of fun. Um, 
And if it's somebody that you don't know well, or they would find that very strange, you don't have to, but um, it opens people up. And then, of course, like with my clothing, no one really knows, but God knows, and I know. And if anyone would be perceptive and start to notice that I only wear certain colors, and that those colors have to coincide with if I, when I went, when it's in a parish and would go to Mass, would coincide with that particular feast day or um, holy day, then they would get the essence, at least, of added spiritual touch, of uniting myself with the church, with God, in all these different aspects, and with creation, with his creation. So... It's probably real long. Anyway, I don't know if it's possible for me to have a short video. We'll keep working toward that end. God bless his real presence in us. And enjoy spiritualizing your temporal world.